Good morning and welcome to worship at Melissa United Methodist. We are so glad that you have chosen to follow us and be with us online. Um, if you have not yet, make sure you print off your lyric sheet so that you can be singing with us. Yes, it feels weird that you're at home and we're here or you're wherever you are. You're at the lake, you're at wherever it is. And so please, we want you to join us in singing. And so um, one way you can do that is print off that lyric sheet. Lyric sheet. If you don't know where that is, it was in that email that we sent this morning. If you have yet to receive that email or if you want to, make sure you comment on Facebook so that we can get you onto that email list and so that you can be getting that information for Sunday mornings. If you will join us in singing because today is the day.
beautiful one. So if you'll join us in singing beautiful one. Two, one. Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore you. Beautiful one, I so must Beautiful one, I love. Beautiful one, I adore Beautiful one, I so influences of the world around us and confess that we worship you alone this is our god let us worship together
are so glad that you have joined us in worship this morning. And thanks for jumping from one Facebook Live to the next one. Hopefully that won't happen again. But today has been a morning of unusual technical difficulties. So you might have seen my post. Say a little prayer for our technology here at the Hub at First United Methodist Church in McKinney. So we can keep everything rolling through worship today. A few quick things as we get started. If you haven't done it already, would you go ahead and open up a new page on your browser? You'll see a comment there in the comments of Facebook where you can enter in a link and register your attendance with us today. This is super helpful because it lets us know who's watching. It reminds us that we're connected to one another, and it's also a great place if you have a prayer request or something you need from our church community. We can make sure we get that to you this week. Second, the next two weeks, we have some different things going on that I want to make sure you've got marked on your calendar. So go ahead and grab a piece of paper and make note of this. Next week, August 23rd at 8 a.m., we're going to have a blessing of the backpacks or the electronics or whatever it is that you're using for school this year. We're going to meet at the Zplex Tennis Courts in Melissa. You see that email or that information on your weekly email, but you can go ahead and message us if you need to receive that information again. We'll meet at 8 a.m. under those covered tennis courts, and we will bless backpacks there. Then we'll gather virtually at 1030 on Facebook Live on our webpage for worship like we normally do. And then at 830 that evening, I'll be leading an evening vespers or prayer service after you get the littlest kids to bed as we get ready to start the school year the next day or in the days to come. Second announcement is this, the Sunday after that on August 30th at 10.30 in the morning on Facebook Live and our webpage, we'll be having our confirmation service. And so our confirmation families will be here, First United Methodist Church of McKinney with us. They'll be out under the pavilion where they will be gathered and ready. We'll lead worship inside the hub as you're accustomed to seeing. And then you'll give us a brief little like two-minute transition that you might not even notice when the scenery will all change and we'll go outside to where our confirmation families are. And we'll go ahead and celebrate their confirmations and baptisms at that time. The last announcement is this. We are still collecting teacher packs. As of this morning, we're at 315 teacher packs. And so I want to encourage you that this is the last week for you to gather those items together. You can drop them off on my doorstep. We'll get them ready. But we have one more week to collect those teacher packs to give out to Melissa ISD and other teachers that are connected to our church. Thank you so much. So one of the other things that we are doing in the life of this church to maintain connection and to build connection is to do a new project called Project Storybook. So Children's Ministry came up with this idea as a way for us to build both a present ministry now and to build on a future when we are in our building. So there's going to be a link to an Amazon wish list, and it's a list of storybooks, of children's books. You can buy one from there, and it'll get shipped directly to us. Or if you have a favorite book, let us know. Send us a message. You can send me a message at peppa at melissaumc.com, and I will be happy to connect with you and get that book from you. Another way that we are building connection, and one that we are going to ask you to help with, is we're going to have folks that are going to record themselves reading these books. So stay tuned for emails and more ways to be involved. And as always, we are so thankful for your generosity, both to children's ministry and to the ministries of this church. It's true that our ministries could not sustain without your generosity and giving. So a reminder that there are three ways to give each week. You can give online at melissaumc.com backslash giving. You can send it to our P.O. Box or you can text us. So we have three ways to accept your gifts and we are grateful for the ways that you sustain us.
in the time of prayer. The ads online and on TV and everywhere we look shout, buy me, you deserve me, you are only worthy with me. And Sundays we shout back, enough. And on other days we let a theology and attitude of scarcity overtake everything that we do. On those days we allow what we have to define us to control us, and to restrict us. You see, God provides enough. God created each of us as enough. God creates a world of abundance, but our certainty of scarcity, our idolatry of the shiny, and our fears of others prevent us from gratitude, graciousness, and sharing. You see, we live in, abun in an abundant world. Our creator makes it so. Move our hearts. Lessen our fears in this hour. There is enough for all of us. Praise be to the God of abundant love. Praise be to the God of enough who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. I feel like I need to put a disclaimer on this message before we get started. You'll see there in the comments on Facebook if you have it. If not, I'm going to tell you now. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Exodus 1, verse 9 through 2, verse 10. It's kind of a longer passage, but I'm going to skip around and paraphrase a bit so we don't have to read straight through it. But the disclaimer really is this. There are some really horrible stories in this book. There are stories of genocide and mass murder and revenge, all kinds of different things. And I was thinking about that this week because some of those things are embedded in this story today that we're about to read. I was thinking as I was driving down 380 and I was having a delightful conversation with a friend on Wednesday. And I witnessed all kinds of really terrible things along the way. I witnessed a person getting arrested. I witnessed a car accident. And it struck me that while there are some really terrible things in this book... There's some really terrible things in life, too. Life's just like that. You have something delightful like a conversation with a friend or a birth of a new child that's mixed in with all the other junk that life brings. And some of it's just terrible. And so the challenge sometimes of reading scripture is not so much to get stuck on when you find something in this book that's absolutely terrible, and not to skip around it or to jump over it, but to read beyond it. For the truth God is speaking, even in the middle of what is sometimes horrible in the world in which we live. So we're going to read this story today about the birth of Moses. And it contains mass murder. And it contains genocide. It contains some horrible things. And beyond that, 
There's a truth that God speaks that we're going to listen for together today. So I'm going to start in in chapter 1, verse 9. I'm going to read all the way through 210. And when I get to certain points, I'm going to just sort of look up and I'll tell you what's kind of happening. And then we'll come back. Okay? So you may not exactly be able to follow if you're reading in your Bible. But if you read this in your Bible later, you'll get the idea of the whole story. He, we're talking about Pharaoh or the king of Egypt. He said to his people, The Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. So come on, let's be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us and then escape from the land. And so Pharaoh goes on and he takes the Israelites and he puts them to hard work and he enslaves them. And he basically confines them in a way that they can't grow anymore. But you know what? As is so often the case, God's people continue to build community. And Pharaoh decides those measures that he's taken of hard work and enslavement, they're not enough. And this is what he does next. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives. Their names were Shiprah and Puah. When you're helping the Hebrew women give birth and you see a baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they did not obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. And when Pharaoh came to the midwives and asked them how there were all these baby boys in the Israelites among the Hebrew people, Shiprah and Puha said this. They said, those Hebrew women are strong. They give birth so much faster than Egyptian women. We just don't get there in time. And so the baby boys lived. Then Pharaoh gave an order to all of his people, throw every baby boy born to the Hebrews into the Nile River, but you can let all the girls live. Now a man from Levi's household married to a Levite, this means they're of a a priestly order. They're like a a white-collar family, not a blue-collar family. They're a family that wouldn't necessarily have experienced all of the horrible things that Pharaoh had done to this point. A man from Levi's household married a Levite woman, and the woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son, and she saw that the baby was healthy and beautiful, so she hid him for three months. And when she couldn't hide him any longer, she took a reed basket and she sealed it with black tar and she put the child in the basket and she set the basket among the reeds at the riverbank. Then the baby's older sister stood watch nearby to see what would happen to him. Pharaoh's daughter came to bathe in the river and while her women servants walked along beside the river, she saw the basket among the reeds and she sent one of her servants to bring it to her. Now, when she opened it, she saw the child and the boy was crying and she felt sorry for him. She said, this must be one of the Hebrews' children. Then the baby's sister said to Pharaoh, would you like me to go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse it, the child, for you? Pharaoh's daughter agreed, yes, do that. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me, and I'll pay you back for your work. So the woman took the child and nursed it. And after the child had grown up, she brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I pulled him out of the water. This is a crazy story. Just to show you how crazy it is, in case you didn't follow all of the things, look at this slide for me and follow the yellow arrows. Start in the top left. Pharaoh's fear means that he wants to enslave or kill everybody so the Hebrews can exist. But Shipra and Puha have enough integrity to know that that's not the right thing. You mix that integrity with Moses' mother's hope and Pharaoh's daughter's compassion and Moses' sister's creativity that returns Moses to his own biological mother and then back to Pharaoh's daughter, then you end up with Moses living in Pharaoh's household. So you've got a Hebrew, an Israelite, the very ones whom Pharaoh wanted to kill, living as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, if you don't think God has a sense of humor, 
Let this story be that reminder for you. That God always makes a way. This story is undergirded with hope and creativity. And a persistent and perseverant belief that God always finds a way. So we're going to take a closer look at the three characters who keep the action moving in this story. And Pharaoh's first. Pharaoh acts out of fear. You know these kind of people in your life. I have been this kind of person in my life. You have been this kind of person as well. Who looks at the world around you and thinks that the numbers are growing too great, that the people are growing too strong, that the forces that are at work against you, whether they be perceived or real, that those things are becoming insurmountable. And because you can't imagine anything else to possibly do, you craft a plan out of fear so that you can regain control of the situation. That's all Pharaoh's doing. We've all done it. The problem is, Pharaoh is in a position of control over mass groups of people that when he chooses to take control back, it has life-altering consequences for a whole demographic of people living under his care. Out of fear, he makes a decision to commit the Israelite people to hard work to enslave them. And when that doesn't work because they are stronger than his fear, he commits himself to taking the baby boys and throwing them into the river. But God makes a way. I want to ask you this morning to think about a time in your life when fear controlled the decisions you made. Think about a time in your life when you were in a place like Pharaoh and you felt your back was up against the wall and you had to make a decision about something. I wonder sometimes if Pharaoh could look back on this period of time in history, I wonder if he regretted it. I wonder if he looked back and thought about the decisions he made out of fear that were best only for him and not for anyone else. I wonder if he regretted it. I wonder if he said to himself, if I was in that position again, here's the list of things I would do differently. Or maybe if he said to himself, if I was ever in that position again, I would never make that decision. Or maybe he simply said to himself, if I'm ever in that position again, I'm going to take my time, take a breath, and think about what's best and not act out of fear. It's true. Sometimes in life, everything is stacked against us. Sometimes in life, it feels like those things are insurmountable and our fear gets the better of us. We do or say something that we regret or we wish we could take back. But it's Pharaoh's fear in this story that offers an opportunity for courage and integrity from Shipra and Puha. I love those names, don't you? Like, I wish that you could just say Shipra and Puha. You should do it in your house right now. Anyway, just say Shipra and Puha because they're really fun names. Shipra and Puha are Hebrew midwives, right? So they're Israelite people. So if Pharaoh's up here and fear is controlling everything he does, Shipra and Puha on the scale of hierarchy in the ancient world are way down here at the bottom. Not only are they women, but they're also just midwives. They're not connected to anyone. They don't have any standing. They simply are given charge of taking care of women who are giving birth. And that's it. In that society, that was all they were good for, the way that society saw them. But it's so true in Scripture that women are sometimes the very people that God uses to change the course of history. And they do it quietly, and they do it behind the scenes, and nobody names who they are, and they don't have a title. They just do it. They think about what Pharaoh has told them to do, to kill all of the baby boys as they're being birthed. And they think to themselves, no way. There's no way I can possibly do that. No matter what the consequence is, I will not follow this order that I have been given. And they don't. 
You see, integrity is defined as a firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values. In other words, incorruptibility. No matter what, no matter what the consequences, no matter what comes from this decision in their life, Shipra and Puha know that they are going to find a way to help those babies to live, even despite Pharaoh's fear that's putting them in a so dangerous of a position. I was in a workshop uh, the month before quarantine started. We called it pre-pandemic when we were talking this morning. And the presenter asked this question. He said, what passion or fire exists within you that you have to speak no matter the cost? I know when we say it in that kind of dramatic way, you think to yourself, maybe there isn't anything, but there is. Think about it. What passion or fire or belief exists within you that you have to speak or live by no matter the cost? Maybe for you, it's as simple as taking care of your family or speaking up for someone you know in your life who can't speak for themselves. Maybe it's bigger. Maybe it's taking on a whole system or taking on a whole set of ideas or, or doing something at work that you know is the right thing despite the fact that everything around you is telling you you should do something else. What is it that exists within you? What fire or passion or belief exists within you that you have to speak? You can't not do. Despite the cost. When we think of Shipra and Puha, I think of integrity. I think of how two women who the world would have looked at and thought, had no standing whatsoever and shouldn't have even had a place in the story, changed the course of everything simply by saying they might have not have had a voice to stand up to Pharaoh's commands. They might not have had the ability to plaster posters anywhere and do big things to make big changes, but what they could do was hold that God's gift of new life could continue to live despite the odds. I wonder when I think of Pharaoh's decision to act out of fear, and Shipra and Puha's decision to act out of integrity. They both had they both had impacts outside of their immediate actions, their immediate sphere of reference. But which do you think had a longer lasting impact on the course of human history? A decision made out of fear or a decision made out of integrity? The third person I want to look at is Pharaoh daughter, last one. Pharaoh is bathing in the river and her attendants are waiting behind her. And she sees in the river this basket and she wonders, herself, huh, I wonder what's in the basket. So she goes and she picks it up and she sees a three-month-old baby boy and he's crying and she feels sorry for him. Something within her is moved. And so she takes him up. She gives him to her servants. Her servants returns back to Pharaoh's daughter's care. But she saw the basket. She saw the baby. She had compassion for him. She felt sorry for him. And she did something about it. We talked a few months ago about that word compassion and about how it actually has two pieces to it. Compassion is both a feeling. It's a thing you feel when you see something that isn't right or someone you feel sorry for or a situation you wish, wish was different. It's a feeling and it's all the desire to do something about it. It's an action. And so it's not enough to see the basket in the river and see this crying baby boy and feel badly for him. You have to choose to bend down and pick him out of the river and do something about it. That's compassion, friends. It saved Moses' life. And so I wonder this morning, what is it in the world or in your work or in the school, or in your neighborhood or in your life, what is it that breaks your heart? What is a need that you see that you think to yourself, this cannot be? And while you may feel powerless to change it, you feel this thing stirring within you that even if you don't know exactly what to do, God's calling you to bend down and pick it up and to hold it for a bit, and to think about the compassion you feel for someone 
who is suffering or for a situation that you don't know how to change and to make some decisions about what to do about that. Because the truth is, friends, we all get to choose the values that guide our life. We get to choose the way in which we live, the things we say, the things we do, the positions we're in. We get to choose the values that govern our life, whether they're fear or integrity or compassion or hope or creativity. And I know that you may not be in a position like Pharaoh or Shipra and Puha or even Pharaoh's daughter, but you are in a position to see someone at the grocery store who might need your help to drive past someone on the road, to listen to a parent who's trying to balance safety with education and work. You might have the opportunity to listen to a teacher who's trying to figure out how to enter into a new phase of history or someone who's been marginalized by society and doesn't exactly know what to do. You may not be Pharaoh or a midwife or someone with power standing next to the river, but someone around you needs your help. And you get to choose. Will your actions and your words be those of fear? Will your actions and your words be those of integrity? Will your actions and words be those of compassion, hope, and creativity? So that when God presents you with an opportunity to stoop down next to a river bank and pick up a basket, And you're not exactly sure what's in it, but when you look in it, you see something that you know needs help. Will you have the courage and will you take the time to do something about it? We struggle with two different things in our lives when it comes to this idea of living with integrity and compassion We struggle with feeling helpless against systems we don't know how to change, and we struggle with not being sure where to find a problem. Friends, the first one, being powerless to change something, that's super easy. Take a small step somewhere. Do a small thing. You may not change a whole system, but you can change something around you. So take it small. Take it easy. But if you're in a place this morning where you're struggling to figure out where the needs around you are, where's the riverbank God's calling you to, to pick something up and look at it, let me encourage you to take a moment and change your perspective. To recognize that no matter where you live or where you work or what you do, someone around you needs help. And if you can't see it, it's because you have to look beyond yourself to find where God needs you most. And you can do that. I know you can. I know the heart God has placed in you to love people. You can do that. May we live by integrity. May we live with compassion. May we live with a hope and creativity that believes in a God who absolutely has a sense of humor and says to us over and over again in this book, God always makes a way. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the words in Scripture that are sometimes difficult to read because they're hard stories of horrible things that happen. But we give you thanks as we read those words in scripture and we look at our lives, we recognize all of life has hard, horrible things that we don't exactly know what to do with. And all of life is laced with your hope. So God, give us perseverance and resiliency. Give us soft hearts, strong backs, that we might see the places you need us. We might take the time and have the courage to bend down and meet a need and that your love might happen through us. God, make us not afraid as we go into the world. Make us feel that fire and passion and belief that we would do anything to live into. God, guide our footsteps and be with us on the journey. Amen. I have this confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God still inside the storm, promise of the shore. I 
trust the power of your word enough to seek your kingdom first beyond the barren place beyond the ocean waves when i walk through the waters i won't be overcome when i go through the rivers i will not be We'll see you next Sunday at 8 a.m. Bring a chair, bring some water, all of those things, because I know it's Texas. It'll still be hot. May you receive this blessing. May God open our eyes and our hearts to the places in the world where need is great and hope is failing. May the creativity of the Holy Spirit aliven in us integrity and compassion, that those things might be a guide along our way. For it's all these things we pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.